Well, I'm going to model the ways in which we um, listen to each other and disagree with each other and do so in the spirit of, of, of warmth and friendliness because I disagree um, with Dawn. I don't think that trans um, women are women and I'm here to explain how I have arrived at that conclusion and how I've been very thoughtful in arriving at that conclusion. Um, so, I'm going to try to um, express this through two events, um, and if you bear with me with this. So, um, these two events were two years apart, and during that time I've learned so much. The first event was in 2015, the second in 2017. So I have to say to my embarrassment, where in 2015 I had never, ever, ever, ever thought about transgenderism as a feminist issue. And I know that other feminists have been doing this for years. I haven't. It had been completely off my radar. Completely. So um, what actually happened was, at that time, I was at the University of Leicester and I was a research fellow there doing some cultural analysis of various things. And I was caught by something, that it was a, a, an image on the cover of Vanity Fair, you may remember it, of Bruce Jenner. And I um, decided that I would analyse what I called his performance of femininity. And I analysed it in the way that I'd analysed things for years and years and years, on the basis that gender is about identity, it's not inherent, it's not tied to biology, and we perform it. We're performing it all the time. I'm, we're, I'm performing it now. I have long hair, I have got earrings in, yes I have, and so on. But um, I'm, a con well, I'm something called a, um, a post-structuralist philosopher, and in that philosophy, I don't know whether I should... Um, <coughs> I'm aware that I'm going to break into lecture mode now because I'm in a lecture theatre <laughs> and you'll be bored to tears probably so I'll try and cut it short. Um, so, um, so, let me go back. In the photograph, Jenna was performing extreme femininity. He wore a mask, I've never worn such a thing in my life, uh, which pinched in his waist and tucked in his male genitals. His large hands were out of sight behind his back. He wore a wig, uh, uh, very long curly hair, and lots of makeup. And he'd had some surgery, I discovered. Um, he'd chosen to have reconstructive facial surgery to feminise his face. He'd had a trachea shave, female hormones, but no genital surgery. So I was interested in this. Um, the visual representation of, of Jenna as ultra-feminine was accompanied by an article which he said, in which, in the same magazine, and which he said he'd always been female, including the times he fathered children and had successfully competed against other male-bodied athletes. So, in order to analyse the cultural meanings of the image, I used the theoretical framework that I'd done forever, um, and in this framework, many of the truths about ourselves that we take as fundamental, that is a standing outside of language or discourse, are understood to be the product of language. So, for example, we can't understand femininity without understanding what masculinity is, and so on. It's, those things are concepts, they reference each other. It doesn't actually emerge from our body. So, I'll skip Derrida and Foucault, which I was <coughs> going to bore you about, and go on. <laughs> I'll tell you if you want. <laughs> so, the philosophical framework that I'd used for years provides a means to understand how patriarchy gets into our heads without you really realising it. So, you know, gender is a symbolic performance we enact as if it's biologically true, and in that symbolic performance we carry all sorts of power relationships and hierarchical meanings. So, in reflecting about Jenny's performance of femininity, I didn't make any moralistic judgment about him or claim that only men who <coughs> identify as women perform femininity. I'm used about the way society was so quick to receive him as a true woman, despite his male body. Um, 
I was rather agno agnostic about him, even indifferent to him as an individual, actually. What I hoped to demonstrate was the way that femininity is socially constructed and performed, including by women themselves. That's all I wanted to do. Well, <clears throat> something happened at this moment, which it's, it was a very significant moment. There were complaints about this article. It was an internal article to the University of Leicester. It was a think piece. It didn't even go out publicly, but somebody has their eye on everything that's written about transgenderism, which I didn't know about, not having thought about transgenderism before even. So the article was asked, the, it was taken down. There were many complaints about it. There was a complaint that I'd uh, contravened the Equality Act 2010, that any transgender members of staff would be deeply hurt by this article. Any students that I taught would find me a very unsafe person to teach them. And actually, I should really lose my job at the University of Leicester. And I tell you, I was frightened. Mm. I was frightened. It was completely out of my experience. And the article duly went to the university, sent it to the um, university's legal team. And after 48 hours, it came back that I hadn't contravened anything. It was within the bounds of academic discussion. There was nothing hateful about it. And so it was reinstated on the site. But in the meantime, what I was asked to do, I had to write back to, they asked me whether I would, and I did. I don't know whether I would now. I was asked to write back to the parents who'd written to me to say that I was telling them that they were wrong to transgender their children. I was telling them that they were wrong about X, Y, and Z. All of this was um, strange and shocking, really. So I did all of that. Then it all died down, but I, I was sort of put it on the shelf in my mind. I have to say, at that time also, I got numerous supportive emails from people in all kinds of different professions, including the media, who said how brave I was. I'm so pleased you wrote that. <coughs> You're putting your head above the parapet. We wouldn't dare to do it. And that, I found very strange. What, what is it that I'm being brave about? Anyway, I, I've learned. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so at that time, I hadn't really understood the reasons why my article had caused such offense. I really didn't quite get it. I now know that I had violated a fundamental tenet of transgender theory, namely the truth claim that trans women are women. In providing a cultural analysis, I had described gender identity as formed in social context. <coughs> I had described uh, our experiences of gender as interpreted and retold from particular perspectives that carry social, emotional, psychological, political, and historical meaning. This meant, I worked out, that I hadn't accepted that gender, Jenner's gender identification meant that he'd always been female. Because if you say you've always been female, what you're saying is that your femaleness, whatever that is, we'll come to that, stands outside of everything that's to everything that's historical, everything that's psychological, everything that's sociological that might have led you to that position. It's the argument that you were born that way, absolutely born that way. It was so antithetical to the way that I understood things. So I'm trying to explain to you, and I know that I don't need to explain to you that there was no transphobia in this at all. It was, a, it was a, it, an intellectual... Um, new area that I was getting myself into. So, what I also hadn't done was position Jenner as a hero, daring to become his true self, transgressing conventional boundaries, and thereby helping all of the rest of us to dismantle binary opposites. I had argued, in fact, that he'd repeated the very conventional gender binary from which he was allegedly freeing himself. I had argued that when gender identity is reified uh, as natural outside of culture, 
then masculinity and femininity are rendered apolitical and outside of, outside of politics. Now I know how serious it was to have said that. Um, and my further crime by, was, by implication, I had critiqued the new transgender language about cis. I didn't even know that word existed. But cis women are those who are allegedly comfortable um, a cis woman, I guess, according to this language, allegedly comfortable with my sexed body, so my gender and my sex match. And trans women are women too, according to this. But they were, since they were born with an inherent feminine identity, but they are in the unfortunate position of having been born with a male body, and therefore, in some sense, if trans women and women belong to the category women, we have women me as privileged over the trans woman so the trans woman then becomes somebody who is more oppressed by patriarchy than myself of course my general argument the thrust of my argument is that there is no such thing as being comfortable with gender we all of us struggle with our gender to take up our gender identities so i was arguing that gender is a kind of prison that, um, yeah, so I won't go on about that. Right, okay. So, and I began to realise that the narrative transgender women are women is essentially and fundamentally tied to the narrative that children can be born in the wrong body. So this led to a book, I'm going to do a book plug here, uh, to me um, editing a uh, creating a, an edit collection with my colleague, Professor Michelle Moore. Uh, uh, the book is just out now, in paperback. It wasn't hardback, it's now out in paperback. It's called Transgender Children and Young People Born in Your Own Body. Um, and we're authors of the month in June. So that's good. Somebody's, somebody's reading it, obviously. So anyway... Um, at this time, I was quickly becoming a figure to target without really understanding, going back to 2015, what it was that I was targeted for. I'm learning. Okay. The second event was in September of 2017 when I was in a committee meeting of the Women's Equality Party in London. I discovered that Women's Place UK was formed in the very same month that this happened. So I, I was in a committee meeting totally private, um, with just committee members and um, the staff, I had suggested that we discuss the possible impact on women of the proposed reforms to the Gender Recognition Act. Um, so, um, and so women outside of the party had already begun discussing this, obviously. And what women do, and, and I hope that and I may be able to cut this bit out because I've got a lot to get through, try and get through this bit quickly. Citing the history of male violence against women, women have been pointing out what is perfectly reasonable, that this change in the law could allow badly motivated men to change gender. In the, this serious issue is degraded, I think, in popular culture now as the toilet issue. Um, as if women have a rather pathetic fear that trans women are intent on assaulting them in lavatories. Some individual trans women, for example, um, Jenna, in the uh, genderquake uh, discussion that he was involved in, insisted indignantly that he wouldn't dream of assaulting a woman. And I have no reason to believe that he, that he, that he wasn't speaking the truth. But he talked about it as if that settles the issue and, the, and what he did point out was the threat to women comes from straight men. So get off. Stop, stop accusing trans women of possible assault. But these propositions demonstrate a complete misunderstanding and denigration of women's reasoned anxiety. We're flagging up a social structural problem, not an individualised problem in that way. People, women are completely aware it's straight men who carry out sexual violence. Um, this is the point. It is precisely because society recognises sexual violence as perpetrated by straight men, not all straight men, obviously, have to qualify that, 
that there are legally protected women-only spaces in the first place. The point of concern is that the law reform will open up the possibility for unscrupulous men to be able to use the legislation in order to access women-only spaces and to commit crimes such as voyeurism, flashing, public masturbation, sexual assault, and even rape. So my raising of the issue of the GRA 2004 in the committee was shut down immediately. I found that quite shocking. I was told that in the Women's Equality Party, we accept everyone into the web. But my point had not been who should, not, should or should not be a party member. It simply hadn't been that. I was flagging up that as a party, the only party dedicated to women's inequality, it was extremely important to ensure women's voices were heard in debate around the legis legislative change that impacts on women's sex-based rights and protections. And what I was being asked to do was identify in the committee was to identify more with vulnerable trans women who might be offended by discussing the Gender Recognition Act, the trans women, trans women in the Women's Equality Party, that they would be offended if we had that discussion. I was being asked to identify more and sympathize more with these people than with the women who were potentially vulnerable to this, to all women who are potentially vulnerable to this changing cultural paradigm. To remain, I argue that to remain silent about possible repercussions of the Gender Recognition Act and reform, the possible reforms, risks the Women's Equality Party in letting a law through which quite possibly <coughs> would cause actual harm to women. So, have I only got two minutes to go? Mm. No. <coughs> <laughs> I'm going to resist. <laughs> I know, I know. <coughs> So I'm going to cut out a bit. I'm going to say, I stand my ground intellectually, politically, and morally on the, uh, uh, around the issue that trans women are not women. I cannot accede to the idea. Why? Um, because intellectually, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, I can't agree to something that intellectually I'm at odds with. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the trans argument that gender is inherent but the body is socially constructed is simply incoherent. I think our bodies are materially real, that we're bifurcated into two different sexes for the purposes of reproduction. What we then do with that, the meanings that we make of that, are social. So I cannot be hounded in to a position where out of fear of standing outside of the norm, I assent to something which I literally cannot do. I can't do it. I cannot do that. Okay. Um, I'm not doing that because I'm transphobic. I, I don't say this because I'm transphobic. Because transphobia is hatred or prejudice against trans people simply because they're trans. And it's founded on a disgust or hatred or some other related negative emotions such as fixed ideas that women and men should conform to gender stereotypes, clearly. I don't hold to that. And if you knew me personally, you would know uh, that, uh, and my friendship group, you would know that I have no phobia whatsoever about trans women. Um, okay, I'm going to cut it all out. Um, I think there's a naive public endorsement of the subversive potential of trans. Uh, I don't, um, yeah. And I don't accept that belonging to an older generation that somehow doesn't get that transgenderism is politically liberal and inclusive and that it's about sparky, happy, rainbow inclusion and diversity. <laughs> On the contrary, I think I had a good grasp of theory and politics and a better grasp than many. So the laudable aim to make minority to, to make heard minority voices has obscured the understanding, you know, that sometimes minority voices can be mistaken about certain things. And the testimony of vulnerable young trans identity pe of people, although extremely moving, um, they cannot be held up, those testimonies, as having the ability to decide at a meta level, at a larger level, what a woman is. 
So the rainbow sparkly vision of equality and diversity is mobilizing, is mobilizing oppressions and inequalities. It silenced the voices of many people, women as a political class, some transgender and transsexual people who are also worried about the uh, uh, proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act, lesbian women who feel no sense of inclusion in LGBT as it currently stands, boys and girls who don't conform to gender stereotypes, thank goodness in my view that they don't, but who have little alternative ways nowadays, um, given the push for transgender ideology on the internet, than to adopt the narrative about themselves, that it's their body that is at fault, rather than gender itself. And sparky rainbow diversity often ruthlessly promotes some voices as authorities over others. Trans women already in the public domain as fashion models or reality TV personalities apparently, they have authority to, 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 to describe what a woman is. Um, lobby groups such as mermaids, diaries and gender intelligence which, which themselves have personal, personal motivations and unex publicly unexamined theories that stand behind their ideas. So in conclusion, I argue that conflicts in the field of transgenderism are conflicts around meaning, the making of meaning, who has the right to make meaning, the appropriate focus for meaning making, whose meaning making is valorized over others, and who gets to do the valorizing. Why do I carry on, you might ask, or I certainly ask it of myself. <laughs> to censor myself, to silence my reasoned ideas and my moral convictions is to conspire in the diminution of my own autonomy and even my own humanity. I stand my ground as a reasonable, moral and passionate defender of social justice for all, whatever one's gender identity, and I say, Transgender women are not women.